right, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Peter Spinner. I'm the president of GoldSeek and SilverSeek.com. And it's a pleasure to be here today with Keith Neumeyer, the president and CEO of First Majestic. Um, so we had some, uh, we're going to do a Q&A here. I'll have, I have some questions. I've compiled some that were sent over. And then at the end, we'll try to take a couple of questions from the audience. So if you have some questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask them at the end. Um, so to start off, I'd like to get an update on First Majestic because there's been a huge change in the company over the last year since we were last at this show. I, fo I have followed First Majestic since its inception um, about 15, 16, 17 years now. So since that time, First Majestic has grown into a multi-mine uh, producer in Mexico, but in the last several months, a huge acquisition took place. Uh, San Dima. So I was going to start off with that. So Keith, if you could tell us more about this acquisition, why did you choose this and how does it change the company? Sure, Peter. Thanks. And uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, you know, we've been, we, we built this business through acquisition, uh, you know, dating back to our first acquisition in January of 2004. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, it's really, you know, our, 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 you know, I don't know, forte, I guess you would call it. You know, we're really good at coming in to old mines. Uh, we've got a very, uh, uh, very well-known and very experienced technical team where we've been able to go into uh, unliked assets or assets that have been, uh, ru you know, been running at a loss for whatever reason or assets that needed exploration or development, new money, uh, new, new thinking processes, new people. And that's how we built the business. And uh, we're very fortunate enough to uh, buy the Santa Elena mine at the end of 2015 which effectively added about 40% of production to our portfolio. And then again in 2018, adding the San Dimas mine um, to our portfolio, doubling the size of the company with one acquisition. You know, and, and I think, you're, as I said in previously today, you're going to be seeing a lot more of these types of transactions just due to what's happening in the mining space. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, and, and this didn't happen overnight. Like We've had our eyes on San Dimas for over a decade. You know, I remember driving down the highway uh, uh, over 10 years ago talking about San Dimas with my operating team and you know, a couple of years later I was able to have a meeting with Randy Smallwood and we started the ball rolling and then uh, you know, almost a decade later we were successful in getting it into our portfolio. You know, this is really you know, the most important mine there is in all of, all of uh, Durango. It's in the top five uh, silver gold mines in the entire country of Mexico. So it's, it's really a game changer for us and uh, we're extremely excited to have it in our portfolio. So when you purchased the asset, there was uh, some talk about the inefficiencies at the mine. What, ha what are you doing to improve the economics of the mine and what are you bringing uh, to, to make this a more valuable asset? Well, the, you know, the uh, on-the-ground relationships with the local ejido and the unions have always been a challenge uh, for the prior owner. Uh, they, they ran into just all kinds of difficulties just because they didn't really have um, you know, a good solid Mexican team. They were really running the mine using expats uh, and they're almost to a point of running the mine from Toronto, which is never a good thing. Uh, we're very hands-on and, and, and uh, we're a completely different type of operator. So we've been able to go in, we've got better relationships with the community, we've got better relationships with the union. Uh, there's many social things that we've done just in a very short period of time, but also the mining methods. Um, you know, they were using concrete uh, um, um, support and steel supports throughout the entire mine and it's not necessary to do, do that. It's, it's not unsafe not to. This is very solid rock and it's one of the ways we're able to uh, uh, achieve some cost savings, but many other methods as well. Uh, uh, at the mill, you know, this mill has not been invested in for over a decade, and we're coming in with new processes and new ideas and automation, and, and the, the next couple of years are going to be very exciting for this asset. You're going to see costs con continually drop. Uh, just since we bought it, it was actually the cost per ton was $160 a ton, and today, actually in December, our costs were $120 a ton. So we think we can break below $100 a ton in the next 12 to 18 months. So looking for 2019, what is the new production profile and cost profile for First Majestic going to look like? The, uh, I don't have the cost off the top of my head. It's somewhere, we put guidance out uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Peter. Uh, I think it's somewhere between 15 and, uh, 13 and 15. This, uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, silver equivalent uh, per ounce. 
Uh, the production is uh, guided by uh, 25 million to 28 million silver equivalent ounces, of which 65% of silver, 35% is gold, and the rest is uh, lead and zinc. So you mentioned something about technologies, and we touch about, uh, talked about it a little bit this morning on the panel. Um, so what are the new technologies that have been implemented, and which ones are you looking to in the future to implement into development of the or actual mining operations or exploration side? What are the new uh, technologies out there that you're looking at? Well, for us, uh, grinding is really the most important technology, the more at least maybe not so much important, but most exciting technology because it's going to have the biggest impact on costs and, and, and which is related to recoveries, meaning that we could actually mine uh, lower grade ores and get, get actually more metal out of it due to higher recoveries, which is quite interesting because in this time where the margins are so thin, if we can add another five or 10 percent recoveries, you know, that's a pretty big, big uh, deal. I was in Austria just uh, in August. I went and saw the largest installation of uh, high-intensity grinding uh, uh, mills in the world. There were 17 of them in a row, and they were invented in Austria, uh, and they were they're licensed to a company named Autotech. So they've been around for you know 20 years, but they've never been used in the mining sector. And then, you know, you know, the mining sector is known for moving very slowly, and I touched on that a little bit earlier today. But um, this company licensed it to Autotech, and the mining sector starting to look at it. Uh, first Neo, first Quantum. Uh, interesting, first Quantum's got two of them, two of the largest in the world. Uh, Nico Eagle, Tech Cominco. You know, they're the real leaders in this industry are starting to adopt this technology, and we're one of the um, um, you know at the forefront of this whole change that's coming in the sector. So, uh, looking at the silver market, uh, we've been seeing the price of silver continue to fall against the price of gold. The ratio is down to 80 to 90 ounces of silver for one ounce of gold. You know, at $15 an ounce, it's not very precious right now. So what, what makes silver? Is it still a precious metal? What, what makes it precious? Well, due to its rarity, you know, you look at, um, we have in our, our presentation, you know, back when I put this company together 16 years ago, or 17, I guess it is, um, there was a le legitimately a large or a handful of companies out there that actually had you know north of 50 percent of the revenue from the sale of silver and uh, you know we became part of that camp or, or, or that club uh, but over time over the last decade we've seen you know most of these companies now become either gold companies or base metal companies where they have not been able to find really good silver assets so you know that tells me that silver is a lot rarer than people think it is. I, I do call it precious, but I also think it's strategic. You know we're mining uh, eight to one on what that means is for every one ounce of gold worldwide, all the miners collectively for every one ounce of gold only mine eight ounces of silver, which is pretty shocking considering we're trading at 85 to one. Um, you know this presentation would not be possible today without silver. Most of you wouldn't even be been able to come to this uh, presentation today without silver. It's one of these metals that is very misunderstood, and and we don't. Most people actually really don't know what its purpose is. You know, I, I continually hear institutions. You know, I ask them point blank, do you, "Do you own silver?" You know, why would I own silver when I own gold? Isn't you know silver just a poor man's gold? And of course, I have to you know get into my spiel about you know the differences. And I walk out of these rooms where you know they, these you know fifty billion dollar funds um, you know run by these young you know guys with MBAs. Um, you know, all of a sudden a, a light turns on in their head, and they go, "Geez, I got to look at silver." And uh, I'm doing as much as that as I possibly can. Uh, you know, I'm quite active on YouTube and uh, do a variety of interviews um, uh, quite regularly. Um, but you know, it takes all of us, uh, you know, to act together collectively to tell the story of silver because it is so critical. If we want to go green and do all the things that we want to do, electrify the planet in all the ways that we talk about, we're going to need a ton more silver and a ton more copper. I've heard you mention that silver is a highly used, uh, needed metal in electric cars. So there's a there's a really strong industrial use for silver. Uh, investor use has been soft for a while. I think crypto was a negative influence for the last and, few and years. And marijuana. In that, yeah, there's all sorts of uh, the hot, the next hot market. So uh, what do you see in, you know, developing? Recently, we've seen the gold price starting to rally. Uh, palladium has had a huge run. Platinum is still lagging behind. So there's there's kind of this, these disconnects. Uh, this is kind of unique. What what do you see developing here in the next years in the, in, in the precious metals markets? Well, these markets are tiny, and um, you know they're really headline-driven more than anything. Um, 
you know, I'm waiting for the day that someone wakes up and says, geez, I, I, I can't produce uh, my iPad or I can't produce my cell phone or, uh, you know, because I can't get silver. You know, one of these days that's going to happen, and I don't. I, you know, I wish it was tomorrow or yesterday. But uh, you know, we, you know, we heard of the zinc story, and zinc rallied from 80 cents to you know doubled up to a buck fifty, buck sixty. Now it's of course corrected. Uh, you know, you're talking about palladium. You know, this is all headline stuff. And one of these days, you know, we will hear the silver silver story. And you're right about electric cars; they're a huge consumer of the metal. Solar panels, another new new uh, consumer. Battery technologies. There's some interesting technology happening by using silver and batteries uh, uh, Boeing's working on some pretty interesting research and you know there's other things going on which will be I think huge drivers for the silver space it's a very tight market um, don't let anyone tell you different uh, uh, you know being in the space of course I, I know I talk to our traders on a regular basis and there is a deficit out there and uh, that deficit doesn't look like it's going to turn around uh, the miners in, in uh, 2018, we don't know the number yet. It gets published in May, but the number is somewhere between 750 and 800 million ounces of production on a worldwide scale. The consumption is somewhere around a billion to 1.1 billion ounces. Recycling is at a 25 year low due to price. There's only about 125, 150 million ounces of recycling happening in the world right now. So that, def that difference of about 150 to 200 million ounces, you know, that is drawing down above ground supplies as every single year is happening the same same thing and there's it's not going to turn around what kind of leverage does first majestic provide to an investor if silver does return to 20 25 30 dollars how does first majestic look at 30 dollars silver well we don't <laughs> for one but i do uh, the company doesn't uh, uh, you know we we have to be realistic we have to budget at uh, uh, close to market prices unfortunately um, uh, but you know if you do put plug in those types of numbers you know into our projections the numbers are pretty dramatic um, you know from a stock perspective you know every a lot of people in this room sees what happens with our stock when silver moves you know we are the purest in the world from, from on the major side so you know if, if you have a dollar move in the silver price you generally have a three dollar move in our share price we well, you know three to one beta is pretty dramatic and uh, you go back and look at you know January 2016 when silver was 1350 and by July of 2016 you know we had a beautiful run almost touching uh, twenty one dollars silver the stock went from four dollars to twenty five dollars over that period of time uh, so we had a seven dollar move in silver prices and a twenty one dollar move in this in the share price and that was only from 13 to 20 I can't even imagine you know a thirty dollar silver what that would do if silver were to stay around 15 16 17 dollars what do you see the value how do you see the values of the miners right now i i personally think we've overshot way overshot ourselves to the downside i've been buying silver stocks including yours last couple weeks um i've been out of the market the last year looking mostly for this market to bottom i i think we've hit a low point um there's a lot of indicators that gold is ready to make its move and if so silver is just ready to to take off but there just doesn't seem to be any investor interest. I mean, institutions, are they around? Are they taking any interest right now? Retail investors are mostly absent? Or? Well, this show is pretty good. Uh, you know, there's more people here at this conference than I thought there was going to be. So that's, that's maybe one sign or well, one positive sign. Uh, the institutions are, uh, 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 you know, kicking the tires a little bit. I just came back from Toronto, the TD conference there, and uh, we had more meetings than we did the previous year. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, people are looking for sure. You know, they, you know, with the U.S. market rolling over, at least the view that potentially the U.S. market's rolling over, there is the the funds starting to look at this industry. But uh, it's it's not going to happen overnight. You know, if you go back and look at what happened uh, in in. Uh, March 2000, when the Nasdaq peaked out at 5,000, you know the mining sector was completely underwater, as bad as it is today. And uh, from 2000 to 2003, the Nasdaq dropped by 80 percent. And as many of you know, the you know bull market in the miners started in 2002 and went for 10 years. And then when the bull market ended, you know what happened? The U.S. market takes off. So unfortunately, it's just a fact of life that uh, you know it's kind of a contrary trade. Uh, the trade has been by U.S., by U.S. dollars, by U.S. stocks, and it's worked very well for the institutions. They've made a fortune. Uh, and, but now they're starting to say, okay, enough is enough, and where do we put our money? I think it's going to start coming back to this sector. We don't know for sure. I don't have a crystal ball. But the early signs, as Peter says, are starting to show some signs of that occurring. 
yeah, what's next? And they look, you look around all these markets, all these markets are extremely overvalued. There's been one hot market after another. Where do you go next? It seems like commodities, precious metals are just sitting there waiting for their, for their turn. Um, with the last several minutes, um, I, I wanted to touch about uh, a little bit on Mexico. If you can give us an update to what's going on there. There's some headlines and some people are concerned. They hear some radical statements from some politicians. Uh, what, what's the truth? What's going on in Mexico? And how, you know, what are the opportunities there? It seems like there's a lot of uh, exploration potential there. It's, you know, it hasn't been open that many years to fo foreign investment coming into the country. So if you give us an update. Yeah, look, I, I don't pay a particular amount of attention to politics. Um, uh, you know, I think that politicians generally um, are love to get in the headlines and they love to make statements that, uh, you know, get people talking and, and, and so on. But generally, you know, most politicians don't do what they say. Um, so, you know, but, but nevertheless, you know, I've not heard AMLO come out and say anything negative towards mining. He's actually been supportive. Uh, there's a couple of people that have moved over into his cabinet that are actually pro-mining. So I, I'm more optimistic today than I was six months ago before his cabinet was put together. There was a lot of headlines at the time. He is very socialist. Uh, there was some concerns about, you know, potentially the taxes going up or, or, or uh, you know, royalties. Or, but he's taken all that off the table. Uh, he's actually publicly said that there won't be any changes to the mining law or to the tax system. Uh, we've seen one positive thing so far. We've actually seen energy costs drop by about 5% just in the last uh, couple of months, which is pretty interesting because we saw energy costs go up 25% in, in 2018. Uh, you know, a couple of percent a, a month, Pemex was increasing um, uh, fuel costs, which is pretty tough when, you know, you know uh, we're a huge consumer of um, uh, diesel, of course, and, you know, 25% move was really hitting us hard and all the Mexicans as well. So now we're seeing that reverse, uh, we, and which is interesting because I've never seen prices drop before, but uh, yeah, AMLO did say he was going to reduce energy costs, and he has come through with that. So we'll see what else he does for the sector. But again, he's not said anything negative about mining. Well, we have a, about three minutes left, so if there's anyone with questions, if you want to come up to the microphone. and uh, My question is for you, Keith. Um, why, uh, if you care to comment on it, do you think that uh, the Fed's bank has accumulated the largest physical hoard in North America, 150 million ounces, roughly what they might do with that? And secondly, your stock seems to be overly shorted in a very nasty way. Would you care to comment on that? Sure. Um, which bank did you were you referring to? JP Morgan, you said? Okay, well, the Fed's bank JP being JP Morgan. Yeah, okay. Um, look, I don't really have a lot of comment on that. You know, I, I read the same stuff you read. Um, I don't know if it's factual or not, so it's really hard for me to comment comment on what JP Morgan is doing in the silver space. Um, I used to work for the banks. So I worked for three of the Canadian, the largest Canadian national banks in the 80s, and uh, I was a trader for the banks. And I know, I can tell you firsthand that they're very risk adverse. Uh, they, don't, they don't like taking on overnight positions. Uh, so for a bank to take on as principal a position of that size, I do have some doubts uh, that they would actually do that just because of my experience. It could be for a client, mind you. Um, uh, but whether it's the bank or not, I, I have my doubts. And uh, uh, the other question was related to um, you had two show shorts. Uh, yeah, the, the short position is you know the short position on silver is at an all time high. So because of our beta, uh, we're picked on. Uh, it's just a natural thing. So when you know silver switches, all of a sudden that short position unwinds. And that's what drove the stock up in 2016 from four bucks to $25 was because we started that year with 14 million shares short. We ended in August at 4 million shares short. And today we have 30 million shares short. So our short position is twice the size that it was at the peak in January 2016. Go ahead. Okay, Ben. Oh, we'll take one more question, and then at the end, Jill's going to come up and we'll raffle off a 10-ounce uh, silver coin from First Majestic. So, Well, take I have a First Majestic silver coin already because uh, <laughs> I'm a shareholder. But yeah. um, in the gold sector, there have been in several uh, significant mergers and acquisitions that have hit the market over the past six months. Uh, most recently, one of the biggest ones. Do you see something similar happening in the silver sector, particularly amongst the mid-sized silver producers, um, some consolidations or takeovers and mergers in the next, uh, say, six months? 
Well, we were part of one, a fairly big one, you know, in, in uh, taking out San Dimas was a $320 million transaction, the biggest in our history. Um, you know, we've got our eyes on stuff. Um, uh, I can't really comment on it, but uh, uh, it, it's, you know, we're, we're all Mexico, so we're a little bit unique. And, and, and uh, you know, for us to go outside of Mexico would be a bit of a game changer for us. So it, it's, uh, you know, it's something that we, we've considered in historically, but nothing that we're taking quite uh, very seriously. Uh, the other silver, you know, uh, there were others in the silver space, uh, you know, Hecla, Coor, you know, uh, there's only a few of them that really uh, would make any sense. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to comment. But uh, look, I, as I said earlier, you're going to see more M&A activity going on because, you know, to build one of these mines, to permit it, build it, and, and, and you know, you're going to go through all the financing risks, all the construction risk, and, uh, you know, you can buy a mine for some of the prices that we paid, out, paid for our last couple of acquisitions. Why not do it? Um, and then the financing window is shut tight right now. The mining sector cannot raise capital currently. So the only way to grow is through M&A activity.